We're going, to, we're going to take a look at how the brain functions in general. And so we're going to start pretty general, and then we're going to go narrow. And the first thing that you might want to think about is what problem exactly is the brain wrestling with? And the major problem is that reality is so complicated. It has so many layers and so many interconnected causal links that it's complex beyond comprehension. And that's a big problem. I mean, you think about all the subatomic complexity. That's, that's a horrible thing. Then there's the complexity at the atomic level, and that's, you know, pretty overwhelming. And then there's the molecular level, which makes the atomic level look simple. And then there's all the comp exceedingly complex structures that emerge out of the molecular level, especially in living organisms. So that would be roughly at the organ level of existence, you know. And then there's you as a totality with your brain. Which is, and the brain is so much more complex than everything else in the universe that it's not even in the same category. So there are estimates, for example, by Gerard Edelman that there are more connections in your brain, more patterns of connections in your brain than there are subatomic particles in the universe. So, you know, that's one major league complex thing, and there's lots of them around, and, you know, they're all integrated into families and then, uh, you know, Roughly tribal groupings, some of which get large enough to be nations, and then that's all embedded inside of some biological system, and so on and so forth, all the way out to the limits of the cosmos. I mean, this is one complicated place. And, you know, your job, in, in large part, is to understand it, but also not to become overwhelmed by it, because you have to simplify it down to the point where you can sort of think about one thing and do one thing. And so you have to screen all of that out. So that the complexity doesn't overwhelm you when you're attempting to do anything, anything simple, even to look at yourself in the mirror, which is also a very complicated thing to do. Part of the problem your brain is, is always facing is, what can I ignore? And the answer to that is, well, you need to ignore almost everything. And, and that's, that's a problem because, of course, it's not always obvious what it's okay, what's okay for you to ignore. You know, and that changes on you suddenly too, because you know, because you have imperfect knowledge, you may think something's irrelevant, and it turns out to be of critical importance. It's a deadly, it's a deadly, deadly, difficult problem. And so, one of the ways that we solve this is we're actually pretty blind to 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 almost everything. You know, our sensory input is limited by our physiological limitations. Certainly, so there's like in terms of vision, we only see a very small. Uh, little slice of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, and it's the same with sounds, and you know, we can only touch things that are basically within our reach, and so that limits things substantially, and, and then there are also things we can't detect, like we're not very good at detecting, um, like we don't have the same ability that say, uh, is it platypuses and some fish can detect electromagnetic disturbances around them on their skin, and like there's senses that we don't have. So, we're, ze we're narrowed a fair bit by what it is that we're able to perceive. Um, and we're actually narrowed in what we can perceive far more than anybody ever guessed. So I'm going to show you a little video here. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold.
When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. So how many of you saw the gorilla? Well, no, let's, let's do it the other side. See the gorilla. Okay. How many of you had no, known about this video beforehand? Yeah, the gorilla part of it. Yeah, so you guys don't count. Now and then, you know, I get someone who's seen it before and they still miss the damn gorilla. So that's pretty funny. <laughs> so, but, but of course, Simon, Dan Simon set this up because his original video got so popular, you know, virally popular, that everybody has seen the invisible gorilla. And so, you know, now he's showing you that, while well, you think you're smart, you've been clued into how blind you are, and it turns out you're not any smarter than you were to begin with, right? So how many people saw all three things that changed? Oh, you've seen it before. So, okay, and how many didn't? Yeah, okay, so the vast majority of you missed one or more of the things that changed. You know, and they're not really trivial things, like the disappearance of a person from six people. That's fairly major. And, you know, the whole background changed color, and you might think you'd clue into that. And so, so the weird thing is, even when you're primed to notice what you're supposed to notice, which is to say, count the balls, and you know that something weird is going to happen, you're not, that still doesn't prime you enough so that you can keep track of all the weird things that are happening. And like this was an absolutely staggering experiment when, when it was first shown. People, the psychologists were just like knocked over by it because the hypothesis up to that point had been always that, you know, you could concentrate on what you were concentrating on, but if something anomalous or unexpected happened, your attention would be automatically devoted towards it. And of course, that's what people would think, right? You'd think that if you're watching people play basketball, and a gorilla walks into the, you know, area, and it's not small, that of course you'd be surprised and you'd see it. And it turns out that that's just wrong. And, you know, it, it tells you a lot about how your nervous system is set up. So you're focusing on counting the balls. And so for some reason, getting the correct answer to the question, how many times are the, is the ball thrown back and forth, turns out to be motivationally significant. Why? Like, why, why did you, you know, you got the instructions, fair enough, but why did you listen to them? Does it narrow your attention to the target? Oh, sure, it does, but the question is, why did you even comply with the instructions? Because you wanted to get the answer right? Yeah, who said that? Because you wanted to get the answer right. Why did you care if you got the answer right? Well, think about it for a minute, like, guess. That means you're smart? It means you're smart. Yeah, that's right. So that's one possibility. It's like instantly you sort of interpret it as a little cognitive test, maybe. And then you want to see if you can do it. And, you know, so that taps into your hierarchy of values. Part of your value is I want to be maybe a smart and competent person, or I want to be at least as smart and competent as everyone else is playing this game. And so, you know, the instruction taps into a pre-existent value structure, and then it's motivating. Okay, so, yeah. What, compliance as well, yes, that's another thing. It's like, the, you know, the room in some ways is set up to ensure a degree of compliance, right? Because there's an, there's an implicit story in the room, which is if I'm at the front of it, and so that sort of makes me at the top of the dominance hierarchy, and the fact that you're here means you've already bought into that presupposition, and so it's a logical thing to do to play along with the game. So, yes. True, that, that's more like the playing a game issue, right? Is that, well, maybe something interesting will happen. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, so there's a variety of reasons why you might listen to the instructions. But the point is the instructions actually tap into your motivation, in your intrinsic motivation enough, so that you will, in fact, attempt to play the game. And then as soon as you play the game, what happens? Well, you focus your very limited attentional resources precisely on what it is that you're supposed to do. Now, we could talk a little bit about how the visual field is set up. So, you know, you, you notice that, like, if I'm looking around the room, if I want to see you, all of you, I can't just stand here and look straight ahead. Because all you people over here, you're like, I can't see, if I'm looking straight ahead, I, I can't see the faces of anyone past here. And I can only see them sort of as blurs, and unless they move. And if they move up something, then I can see the movement, but I can't, it's not clear to me what's moving. And it's the same for the people over here. The only person I can really see right now is the, is the woman who's sitting there in the white sweater. All the rest of you are like, 
and the, and the person to the right, I can more or less, as long as I look at her, I can more or less see that he's dressed in gray, but I can't see his face at all. Now he nodded his head and I can pick that up. So what's very strange about your visual system and your sensory systems are like this in, in, in uh, you know, all your sensory systems are like this, is that you have a tiny little point of focus where the information is rich and that's partly because so the center of your eye is the fovea and it's most densely uh, it's most densely packed with cells but more importantly each of the cells in your fovea which is the very center of your vision you can tell when someone's pointing their fovea, fovea at you because then you ha you know you have the sense that they're looking at you and human beings are unbelievably good at figuring out when someone is pointing their fovea at you uh, we, we can we can detect eye um, what would you call it? Deviation from direct gaze with an accuracy that's absolutely remarkable. Now each of those little cells in the fovea is connected, each of the one cells is connected to like 20,000 cells at the first level of the hierarchy of the visual system. And so the reason that your whole eye isn't fovea is because your head would have to be this big to manage it. So, you know, what's evolved is sort of a compromise is that in the center of your vision, it's, the center of your vision is very, very detailed. And, and then what you do is you zip that center around, like snap, 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 and your brain sort of makes a, a amalgamated picture out of all those little snapshots. And, you know, then it weaves it together so it seems to you like it's a continuous, what, a continuous movie of consciousness, even though it's really not. And then the sides of your eyes, the periphery of your eyes, well, they don't have the same potency as the fovea and so they, they kind of play a triage game it's like okay I can't see if I'm looking straight ahead I can't see everything what might I use as an indication that I should move my gaze from where I'm looking to somewhere else and one answer to that is movement so the periphery is pretty good at picking up movement and so often if you see movement in the periphery then you'll move your foveal vision to where the movement was and then you know then you can keep track of what's changing. So what your brain sort of assumes is that when you're looking at something, everything else is irrelevant and it's also, it also sort of fades into the background. And so that's what's happening with the gorilla video. And so the, part of the reason you can't see the damn gorilla is because he's dressed in black like the players. And so when you're focusing on the basketball, all the black moving things look the same you know, there's no distinction between them at all. And then the background of the curtain, it's like, well, first of all, why would you be primed to see the curtain change color? Like, things just don't do that in real life, right? I mean, big objects don't suddenly change color, or very, very seldomly. So, and, but, and more importantly, the fact that the gorilla shows up, the fact that one player leaves, and the fact that the curtains change color, has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not you can complete the task, right? So it doesn't matter if you ignore the information, and that's because it's irrelevant in terms of the interpretive frame, the motivated interpretive frame that you're applying to the scene. And so the rule for perception is don't pay attention to anything that isn't directly relevant to the desired outcome. Now exactly how you calculate what you can pay attention to and what you can't, that's very complicated. It's I mean, you build that knowledge bit by bit over time, and, and, and you can be wrong about it, too. But, um, so, so the old idea was, you know, well, first of all, that you were very much conscious of the environment, period, which you're not. And then the second idea was, well, while you're being conscious of the environment, if anything changes radically, you will definitely focus your attention on it. And then... And what turned out to be the case is, well, you're not very conscious of the environment, and radical things can happen, and you won't notice them unless they interfere with what you're doing. So something that emerges that interferes what, with what you're doing that you don't expect, you will in instantly orient towards and concentrate on. So it isn't anomaly or novelty that attracts your attention. It's the unexpected disruption of the relationship between your behaviors and the desired outcome of those behaviors. And that's a much narrower claim. Only pay attention to things that make you fail. It's something like that. Or at least additionally pay attention to things that make you fail. And you know, generally speaking, 
that's also associated with an emotional response, you know. So if you're doing something and, and you know, you think you know how to do it, and so you're doing it, and then all of a sudden something unexpected happens, you're going to have an emotional reaction. And we'll talk more about the emotional reactions in the next class, but the emotional reaction partly prepares you for the worst in case this unexpected thing is bigger than you think it is and sort of also primes you to be curious and to start to explore to figure out what it is so that you can reconstruct your expectations and desires in accordance with the transforming world.